So I want to welcome every person here today to the Community Adventist Fellowship. We have visitors here today, and uh, we want to give you a very, very warm welcome. This program today is going to, because we're going to have a program also like this one this afternoon, is going to introduce a new phase of our ministry, and that is an outreach to the Chinese people. As each of you know, we have a, a major outreach as far as the Russians and the Ukrainians are concerned. But this is going to start a new day in our ministry when we reach out to the 1.2 billion Chinese people. As some of you know, I love history, and I love the history of the Waldenses or the Valdenses. I've been up there to the north of Italy, and I have explored the valleys of the Piedmont, the Angrogna, the valleys of the Waldenses. Who were they? They were a little group of Christians. Yes, there were thousands, tens of thousands of them, maybe hundreds of thousands. A little group of Christians who kept the torch of truth burning brightly when Europe was covered in darkness. Some time back, I was visiting 3ABN, going to see my friends Danny and Linda Shelton. It was about four in the afternoon. It was summertime. And as I drove from the city of St. Louis to the city of Benton, <laughs> and then down to Thompsonville, which is hardly a big city, just a few hundred people, there came a great storm. I don't think I've seen such a black cloud. As I was driving, it was bright sunshine. Then there came this enormous cloud with heavy, heavy rain. It was as though it was midnight. Everybody had to turn on their lights. Darkness had come over the face of the land. And this is exactly what happened in Europe for more than a thousand years. When the church and the state joined together, the light of the gospel was almost extinguished, except among the Huguenots in France and the Valdenses in the north of Italy. These people were holding fast to the truth long before the Protestants, long before the Protestant Reformation. There were Protestants before the Protestants. The Waldenses had in their possession their own version of the Holy Scriptures. I want you to turn to a text, would you please, to the book of Isaiah, book of Isaiah, chapter uh, 60, and verses 1 to 3. And these words describe the very conditions we're talking about. And they have particular reference to these last days. Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 1 and onwards. The Bible says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The Bible talks about a time of complete spiritual apostasy. And the Bible says that the light of the gospel will arise upon the people of God. I will never forget, there are are impressions that you never, never get over. I can remember going into an old Waldensian church up there high on the mountains, up in the Alps. I was taken there by an old Waldensian elder and there written on the walls in the ancient Walden Waldensian language were the words, the light shineth in darkness. When all of Europe, this was long before America, America had not even been thought of, let alone Australia. But many, many years ago, when the world was in darkness, there was light in the valley. The Waldenses were people of the book. They believed in the true gospel. Those of you who come to my church know that there is a true gospel and there is a false gospel. There is the true gospel of the Bible, 
And there is the false gospel of faith plus works. And the Waldenses believed in the gospel of the Bible. The statement has been made, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. And when the night was so black, inky black, God raised up missionaries up there in the valleys of the Vaudois, the Waldenses. They were a missionary people. Two by two, they would go down into the valleys of Rome and then surround the world. They would carry concealed under their coats little portions of Holy Scripture. And at an opportune time, they would take out a portion of Holy Scripture and share it with an interested soul. I remember going into the Waldensian, Waldensian Museum, taken again by an old Waldensian elder, and he pointed out to me the words carved on the wall that said, Ye shall be missionaries, or ye shall be nothing. They believed. I've never forgotten, my friend, their courage, their love, their martyrdoms, their belief in evangelism. Listen to this, as Beverly said today, eloquently. If we believe the Bible, one must believe in evangelism. I was talking today, just a few days ago rather, to a lady who was preparing my taxes, who was a Christian. She said, there are not many today who believe in evangelism. This to me would indicate, if that were so, there are not many today who believe in the Bible. Because if you believe in the Bible, you must believe in evangelism. Let me tell you why. The meaning of the word, it comes from a Greek word, Euangelion. Say it with me. Euangelion. You know what that word means? A good message, good news, the glad tidings. Euangelion. That is the word for the gospel. Good news. And the word evangelist, evangelism, comes from the word the gospel. If you believe in the gospel, you must believe in evangelism. What is this good message? The good message is that there is a Father, a Creator God who made us in His own image. And even though we have all sinned, there is a solution to the problem of sin and death. The good news is that God gave Himself in the person of His Son and His Son paid the price for our sins, made a complete sacrificial atonement for our sins, went down in the tomb, rose from the dead, intercedes for us, and will come again in power and great glory. That is the good news. Is it not good news? America at present has lots of bad news. But the Bible, my friend, is a book of good news. Most people... Well, I don't know if this is true. Most, some people do like sharing bad news. But a person, my friend, no person was ever martyred for his faith in bad news. People, my friend, will only go forth and struggle and give their lives when they're bearers of the best news in the world. Who wants to die for bad news. You see, you can't keep good news to yourself. When I read the Bible, the overwhelming evidence teaches evangelism. Let me give you some reasons. God, the Father, was the first evangelist. Did you know this? The Bible says in Genesis 3, when the human race had gone astray, that God the Father came walking to see Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He didn't come in the morning, as said Matthew Henry, as though in haste to smite. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, says, he did not come at noonday as in the heat of passion. 
But when the earth was stilled and quiet, the father came, not running, but walking and saying, where are you? The first evangelist who goes after his lost son and daughter and says, where are you? God the Son was an evangelist and still is. Jesus was the greatest evangelist. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He believed in the lostness of the human race. He didn't teach that all men were born in a state of innocency, born saved. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. If there had been any other way, there would never have been a cross. The Son of God was an evangelist. He told stories about evangelism, how the good shepherd leaves the rest in the fold and goes out into the coldness of the night and with bruised and bleeding feet, he looks for the one lost sheep. Jesus was no armchair theologian. God the Holy Spirit is an evangelist. He is the active agent involved in evangelism. He goes and he talks to human hearts. John chapter 16, Jesus said, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He will testify of me. He will lead people to Christ. The Holy Spirit is an evangelist. The prophets were evangelists. The apostles were evangelists. People say, it's different today. It is. But God has not changed. Peter was the evangelist. The great evangelist sent forth by the church, sent forth by God. The apostle Paul, the, listen to this, and I say this to any theologian who may be listening. <laughs> The greatest theologian in the history of the human race, the greatest mind outside of the mind of Christ was an evangelist. Paul, the greatest scholar, a preacher of the gospel, an evangelist. I want to say to you today this, I want everybody to hear this, the greatest work in the world is evangelism. Oh, I know today in our church has come upon hard times. But I recall to mind the words of the great pastor evangelist Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Probably the greatest preacher the world has seen since St. Paul. Charles Haddon Spurgeon from his great tabernacle in London in the last century said the words, When the church despises the pulpit, God will despise her. And so the greatest saints, the true leaders of the church, are and have been evangelists. Let me tell you, all a call to be missionaries. A person whom we esteem in our church, a little gray-haired lady who wrote many books, Ellen White said, every child, every person born into the kingdom of God is born as a missionary. So all are called to be missionaries. I note when I read Holy Scripture that God's message of salvation, the message of love and grace is for all the peoples of the earth. It is not a sectarian message or a racially motivated message. Would you please take your Bible, turn to the words of the greatest theologian, the greatest preacher, the greatest evangelist. Romans 9, verse 25 and 26. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. 
and it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them you are not my people they will be called sons of the living God and chapter 10 verses 10 to 13 for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And uh, as one famous American said, was it Martin Luther King? He said, it is not color, but character. Not color, but character. God, the great evangelist, is seeking the lost on every continent, every city, every village. And you know the text, my friend, when you turn to the Apocalypse, the last book in the Bible, there is a picture there of the great multitude standing before the throne of God. And the Bible says they came from every tribe, language, nation, and people, and they're praising God beside the sea of glass, mingled as it were with fire. And then when you read the story of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, it is a proclamation to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Therefore, the message of God is bigger than nations. It is bigger than America. It is bigger, my friend, than Great Britain. It is far bigger than Australia. It is bigger than any church. Not sectarian. Not color-bound. We have in our church today some representatives of the peoples of the earth. Not every nation, but people who are going to represent the segments of humanity. And I've, if I have left out your segment, just realize that probably you're mixed up in there somewhere. So I'm going to ask my friends who are members of my church to come over here and stand with me. This message we believe in has the solution to human hearts everywhere. People have come to my church and they say, do you have a special black ministry? I say, no. You don't? No. Do you have a special Hispanic ministry? No, don't. Do you have a special white ministry? No. Do you have a special Asian ministry? No. You don't? Why not? We simply have a people ministry. And when we read our Bibles, we discover that God is colorblind. So you see, we don't believe in any form of racism. Did you know if you were to take a black man and cut him right through the middle and cut me through the middle, you know what? We're the same. We both have got stomachs. Both have got an Intestines, both have got livers, pancreas, lungs. We both got hearts. The human race is a unity. We come from the same parents. Only the devil and his disciples try to make a lot of difference between people. But this gospel, my friend, that I've preached around the world, meets the needs of people everywhere, like Cindy. Cindy Tuller. A little closer, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Not too close, Cindy. <laughs> 
<laughs> Cindy is a member of our church, and I'm so glad she is. I believe she's been a member of our church now for some three or four years. And Cindy is standing here today because she represents people like me. <laughs> no, no, no. She represents the European part of the human race. Cindy, what does Jesus mean to you? Well, Jesus is my best friend. He's my personal savior, and I believe that he died on the cross for me so that one day I could spend eternity with him. And it's one thing to say that and another thing to realize what type of love that entails on his part for us. And I think the more that you realize what Jesus has done for all of us and how much he loves us, your heart's broken with gratitude for him. And the more our heart is broken, the more that we want to love and honor him, not because of any reward or thanks, but um, as gratitude and love. And our reward is that we may serve him and we can take the gospel of Jesus and let others know about the good news. And that's what I love so much about this church is that we do that a lot and love people into the kingdom and teach them about Jesus and what he's done for them. Bless you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy's a very special person, and she helps take care of our audio cassettes. One cannot work in Los Angeles without realizing that almost everybody speaks English. <laughs> no, almost everybody speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. Espanol? Is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying. Uh, gracias. Mm -hmm. And we have with us a person who represents the vast nation of the Hispanics. What a contribution they have made in the history of the human race. We have with us today one of the elders of our church, Jose Salgati. We're very glad that you're with us, Jose. I want to tell you something. You don't have black minister. You don't have a Spanish minister, but you have men and women who work, work for God. This is a very important thing. That is. This is true. We have a ministry for Spanish people, a ministry for Anglo people, a ministry for black people because they're part of the human race. But we don't make any difference between them. Tell us, what does Jesus mean to you, and what does evangelism mean to you? The first thing, Pastor, I want to give thanks to God today because Sunday somebody, German man, knocked my door, my uh, door in my house, and gave me the beautiful word of God. Today I have the responsibility to God with my Jesus Christ. I want to give the rest of the world. The, the beautiful world of God. Therefore, my family and me chose this church because this church has a mission. He want to, to work in this mission with you and with all the people who want to work for God. This is very important for me and Jesus Christ for me. I have a responsibility with him forever because he's my love. And you know, Brother Salgari, in February we're going to have a big campaign in this church and we're going to see lots and lots of Spanish people, Hispanic people come to this church and they're going to become part of the family of God. Thank you for being a special member of our church. Thank you. This church and the Carter Report have had a great ministry to the people of the ex-Soviet Union. We have had come to our meetings some two and a half million Russians and Ukrainians and other people of that vast part of the world. And we're so glad to have a representative from that part of the world today. Would you like to come? We're just very, very glad to have Evelyn with us. Come a little closer, Evelyn. Glad to have you as a member of my church. Thank you. Would you tell us what Jesus means to you? And then would you tell us a little bit of the needs of your people? Yes, of course. Um, Jesus is my savior um, because he set me free. Um, he gives you hope. He gives you no worries, um, security, and, and a lot of love. 
Um, being from Russia, I can tell you that right now um, it's going through a lot of tough times. People of Russia are in despair. They've lost hope. The government has been failing them for of almost for a century now, and the democratic system is not is not working right now in Russia. And I think it's important that we let them know that um, only Jesus, Jesus is the way, and no political system or government could give them as much hope as could Jesus could. And the only way to introduce them to the gospel and the good news is to go there and preach. Um, when it, comes, when it comes to Christ, nationalities, races, or any such things uh, are simply irrelevant. What's important is who has the opportunity to preach the gospel. And whoever it is, please make sure that you take advantage of it and complete your mission. Bless you, Evelyn. We're glad and honored to have you as a member of our church. Thank you. We have a very special person in our church. He's an artist. He's painted for me. He did a great painting of Christ. He is a fine singer. And he's a fine Christian. His name is Jay Evans. Jay, we're glad that you're a member of our church. And you represent millions and millions of Americans. And you represent millions of people from around the world. People who have responded to the grace of God, just as we have. We're glad that you're a part of the kingdom of God. Jay, would you tell us, how do you feel about Jesus? Well, uh, while I was thinking, I just can't think of a human adjective that describes the love and joy that I have for the Lord. And the things that I've done in my life to know that he can forgive me, as I've grown, is learn, I've learned how to forgive others in the same way. It's very important that we have this type of brotherly love, filius love for others. And for me, when it comes to evangelism, being a missionary myself in a, um, about a year and a half in Indonesia and other, almost other 15 countries that I've visited, it's a joy to be able to know so many races and cultures and to have a church that has that same feeling allows me to have a part of heaven here because this is what heaven's going to be, all races as one family. And it's very important. Bless you. Thank you, Jay. We're glad and honored to have you in our church. Perhaps the people who have influenced the human race more than anybody else of the Jews, the children of Israel. And of course, the Jews are part of a big family called the Semites. And we have here today our resident rabbi. <laughs> We're just glad to have Blake with us, Blake Wexler. And Blake, just come a little closer. Blake. Blake, we're glad to have you in our church. And would you tell us what brought you to this church, how you came and what happened to you? Well, you mentioned uh, Semites, and I'll tell you that there are definitely no anti-Semites here. Uh, this congregation definitely has embraced Judaism, and it's a miracle for a Jew to accept Christ. Uh, I grew up in a Jewish home. Christ, uh, Jesus, or his Hebrew name, Yeshua, was the furthest thing uh, from Judaism. But I, I've said this before, and I've realized this, and it's uh, been the help of my wife and this congregation that not only do I share his blood, that I'm related to the greatest Jew that ever lived, but I'm covered in it. And it's a wonderful thing to realize that. Amen. So you share his blood and you're covered by his blood. That's absolutely beautiful. What do you think about preaching the gospel? What do you think about evangelism? Well, uh, we follow Christ's example. I've uh, personally tried to reach uh, Jews just because I have an extreme interest in it. Uh, his love, the love that, that I've been shown here at this congregation, uh, it's, it's been spread to my mother who's been acquainted with Christ now and my sister and other friends. Those are the circles that I'm in. And uh, I'm, I feel great about it. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling of joy knowing that you can spread the word like that. Bless you, Blake. Thank you. Shalom. 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 Mm -hmm. Shalom.
Aren't these beautiful people? Now, one of our latest additions to our church family is Tiffany Lynn. Come, Tiffany. We're just very, very glad to have Tiffany with us. She represents the Asian people. What a great family that is. The Chinese alone, 1.2 billion Chinese, 260 million Americans, you know. America's been around for 400 years at the most. China has been a nation with emperors, a bureaucracy, everything for 4,000 years plus. These were the people who helped to invent writing. And we're glad to have Tiffany with us. Tiffany, tell us, what does Jesus mean to you? You came to our church. You came to know Christ. We were baptized in this church a little over a year ago. What does Jesus mean to you? And what do you think about evangelism? And your name, her name means in Chinese, a peaceful forest. We welcome this peaceful forest. Thank you, Pastor. Um, Jesus has been in my life, even when I was not a Christian, since I was a little kid, he was always around me, protecting me when I was even not aware of it. And um, since I met my boyfriend and his mo mother had invited me here, but because of my um, experience in, in when I was young, I was a little hesitant about it. And, uh, but when I came here, um, Pastor Carter just so happened was uh, preaching, I believe is miracle from God, was preaching um, the Invisible, Visible Church member. That totally uh, cleared my mind, the, the blockage I have. And ever since then, I realized every event in my life and people I encounter and people I've helped has always brought to from, uh, from Christ, and I bring the glory to him. Tiffany, that's a wonderful testimony. How do you feel about reaching out to the Chinese people? How do you feel about the communication of the gospel? Um, from before, I know from the documentation that uh, during the first beginning of the communist era, that people who want to, uh, Christians, that they have to um, get together, meet together in secrecy. And, and in, they constantly had, was under the pressure and the stress of being um, executed or being captured. Now that the communist era, uh, communist era has been opening up, but they were, they're flooded by Western uh, culture, living, society, and, and, and uh, right now at this point, I feel that the Christian life has, should, ha should brought closer um, Chinese and uh, Americans and bring, bring cr our Christian beliefs into China more and influence more than the, the living, the way they, the bad living I, I consider, um, bring it to Chinese society, to the people, and so people there could come to know God more and to come to um, under his grace and uh, to believe in him and be with him. Tiffany, we're so glad to have such a beautiful Chinese lady as you in our church. God bless you. We're glad to have all of you in our church. Thank you. God has got a special work for every person to do, that only you can do. I can't do your work, you can't do mine. God has got a plan and a purpose for every, every life. On Tuesday nights, we have a wonderful lady who comes for Bible study. Her name is Mrs. Marcella Casido. Did you know this? that God, my friend, has his representatives right where they're needed, most of all. God had Daniel in the court of Babylon. The New Testament tells us that there were believers in the palace of Caesar. God had Joseph in the court of Pharaoh. And God had Sister Casido in the court of Chiang Kai-shek, who was the president 
of China and the leader of hundreds of millions of people. We're glad to have this beautiful, dear, sweet lady with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about your work with Madam Chiang Kai-shek? Now, we'll give our people here a little history. The boy emperor was cast off the throne, I think, in 1912, the last Chinese emperor. And then there came Sun Yat-sen around that time. And then after that, there came President Chiang Kai-shek. And Madam Chiang Kai-shek was as famous as her husband. Tell us, did you work for Madam Chiang Kai-shek? I worked for Madam Chiang Kai-shek as a nurse. I stayed in their home, and uh, my work was to give her whole body massage every day. And... Uh, some other kind of, uh, fom like fermentations, if you have heard about fermentations, those heating pads, and that's what I did for her, and for her mother, Madam Sung. Now tell us, for how long did you work for Madam Chiang Kai-shek? What's that? For how long did you work? I started in 1928, and I stopped about 1934. So you worked for six years. And that, of course, when Chiang Kai-shek was at the height of his power. Who invited you to work for Chiang Kai-shek and his wife? Uh, Dr. Miller, ah. the founder of uh, medical work throughout the Far East. Shanghai, Philippines, Japan, Korea, and the uh, Indonesian countries, and even uh, Bangkok. As some of you folks will know, Dr. Miller was an Adventist Christian. What a work he did. He built sanitariums in China, other places. And he came to this precious sister who comes from the Philippines because the Chiang Kai-sheks got to know Dr. Miller and he touched Chiang Kai-shek and his wife in a remarkable and powerful way. And this precious Christian who comes to our church on Tuesday nights for Bible study was like Esther in the court of Xerxes, like Joseph in the court of Pharaoh. I want to tell you, God has got his people where they need to be. We're glad to have you with us today. I want to say something. Yes, indeed. At that time, uh, Shanghai was called the Paris of the East. And there are, it's, it's big city divided into different concessions. There's Brit British concession, there is French concession and other different concession. And we have big hospitals in Shanghai. One is St. Luke's and the other one is, uh, that I know of, is St. John's. But this uh, Madam Chiang Kai-shek uh, and her husband patronized the Shanghai Sanitarium and Hospital where I work. Bless you. And we call it the right arm. Medical work is the right arm of the medicines. God bless Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you. So my friend, there is some history for you. Did you know that Jeremiah said, before I was in my mother's womb, the Lord knew me. God was looking for a person who would do his will. And he found that person in Sister Marcella. I want to ask you the question. If this is true, what we've said here today, if God has a work for every person to do, then God has a work for you to do. 
And I ask you the question, if not you, who? And if not now, when? Can I open my heart to you? We have been constrained by the Holy Spirit to take the good news to Russia, where we have spoken to millions. Continue to do so on Russian television. We have a work, you have a work to do in North America and in Latin America and in China. And God has led us to do this work. Churches to be built, congregations to be raised up. Listen to me. I want to tell you a story that comes from the lips of Pastor George Vanderman, one of the greatest, one of the saints of God. He tells a story that up there in the north of Italy in the valleys of the Piedmont where the Waldenses used to live and preach the word of God with power, a group of our young people were gathered together one evening on a Saturday night and they were having a social. And they were singing scripture songs and they were reading from the Bible and they were telling good old-fashioned mission stories how the church would go out and preach the word of God. And they noticed an old gray-haired man who was standing in the shadows, cast by the flames. And as they talked on about their belief in Christ and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, the old man stepped forward and he said, May I have a word? They said, Yes. He said, I am a Waldensian. I am an elder in the church. But he said, something has happened. Besides these churches where we wrote the words, the light shines in darkness, we have built dance halls. He said, perhaps most of our people have become communists. We no longer believe. We go down to the valleys, yes, but we go down there for feasting and rioting and drunkenness. And then he said, from what I've heard, you believe what we believed. And he said, someone surely must take up the torch and hold it high until Jesus comes. But then he turned to our young people and he said, you must carry on. I say it to you. You must carry on. If not you, who? And if not now, when? Russia calls us every day. The ruble, when we went there, was worth $1.30. Now, on the same scale, 20,000 rubles to a dollar. We're building a church in Nizhny Novgorod. The mafia has moved in and taken lots of our stuff. We have believers today who are starving Believers like this girl here who are starving for want of food. You must take up the torch. Amen. Please bow your heads. Our Father, you've touched our hearts today. Thank you for these beautiful representatives of the peoples of the earth. Thank you that in the, the palace of President Chiang Kai-shek, there was a Christian nurse 
Thank you that at the seat of power there was Dr. Miller advising, counseling, healing, and helping. Thank you that you have your people at the right time and the right place. And you have called us like Esther, like Daniel, like Joseph, like Marcella here today for such a time as this. Bless this congregation. Wipe away the blindness, the indifference, the apathy. And help us to realize that we are called to take up the torch and to hold it high until Jesus comes. Bless Alexander, our friend in Nizhny Novgorod, who is almost at the point of physical and nervous collapse. The building of the churches, at least one of them has come to a standstill. There is so much to do. Bless the campaign as we prepare it for the city of Los Angeles and in February. We dedicate ourselves to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.